Crank up the volume and get ready for real-world bird hunting by listening to the Wingman Podcast by Eastman's. Now your host, Todd Helms. Hey guys, Todd Helms with another episode of the Wingman Podcast, and I'm here today with Kyle Warren from Paint River Llewellyn's in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, my old stomping grounds. Kyle, man, how are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I appreciate you saying yes and coming on. You and I have uh, some some ground to cover. I was just complimenting you on that on that background. That takes me back, man. I, I love it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's you said it's one of your favorite grouse covers, um, but without giving away details, we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's. Uh... It's uh, it's about as close as anybody gets to it is seeing the background in my Zoom uh, meetings. <laughs> yeah, no, I love it. I love it. Yeah, I those those good honey holes like that, you gotta t- protect them and and take care of them. That's for sure. But tell us, tell us about Paint River Llewellyns. Tell us about who you are, what you guys do, your philosophy. You know, I've done some done a little bit of digging on you, but I want to hear it from from your mouth i want the audience to hear it and you know i discovered you guys on uh instagram and was actually looking for a dog for my dad and came across your dogs and kind of what you and kind of liked what i saw but fill us in give us the give us the skinny sure um so uh uh my name's kyle warren i've i've uh been a pro dog trainer since I was a teenager, uh, and, um, dogs have always taken care of me. So I've been very fortunate to always be training dogs, um, really trained everything under the sun, uh, with, um, law enforcement dogs, search and rescue dogs, upland dogs, waterfowl dogs, uh, rehab, aggressive dogs. But, uh, what got me into dogs when I was a kid was, um, uh, was the bird dogs, you know? So my three of my aunts professionally bred dogs and, uh, one of them had bred uh, German shorthaired pointers for a number of years. And we got a short hair when I was 10. Uh, we belonged to, I lived in the Catskills in upstate New York. And uh, we belonged to a, a, a nice um, upland hunting club that there was like 20 guys and we released the pheasants and the chuckers, but it was on a thousand acre pig farm. Uh, so there were a lot of grouse there in that kind of like rolling hill country in the um, uh, western portion of the Catskills. And uh i got hooked you know we would always see um you know the number of birds we got put out between the pheasants and the chucker and then you had to put like a number of birds that you took of each and they always had a column for grouse and you know everybody would have like flush two got zero flush four got zero (laughs) you know know, release 30 pheasants you know got 29 you know that kind of thing so um so i was hooked from that early age and uh just as as time went on i uh dabbled in some other breeds i i had um uh wired hair vishlas and smooth coat vishlas uh a couple britneys and um in my early 20s i i settled on uh the llewellyn setter which for listeners that uh uh might not be familiar with llewellyn setters it's an english setter but of a particular strain or background and um so i had trained uh a number of them and i I love the vishla uh i just could not have any luck health wise no matter what country i brought bought the dog from no matter what health test i just they we just were not meant to be unfortunately so so i said you know what i'm gonna uh research breeders and uh i got my first uh llewellyn in uh 2004 um and uh from there it became an obsession that uh those dogs just uh collectively handled grouse better than all the dogs that i had before and every all the other people's dogs that i was uh training and uh they were just the easiest handling most natural dog collectively that i've handled uh that um uh handle grouse really well so so that started it um I, I live in the Upper Peninsula now. Um, I've had a camp here for 10 years, been living here full time for uh, over two years, bought a homestead property uh, four years ago, 
um, and uh, used to commute back and forth several times a year, the 1200 mile trek. Um, but once I, once I bought my camp here, um, you know, which was eight or nine years into my Llewellyn uh, passion, um, I just, after one hunting season here, I knew I had to move here to be able to hunt the UP, Wisconsin, Minnesota, you know, it's a uh, heart of grouse country and um, you can drive several hours in most directions. And if you got good dogs, you know what you're looking for, you're usually going to have a good day. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I, I uh, so my whole focus shifted from having uh, a couple litters here and there um, to uh, 10 years ago, focusing on um, building up the breeding program. Uh, I've raised over 100 Llewellyns myself in the last 18 years up to their first hunting season. Wow. Um, and uh, while I have dogs that I've bred that are in my program that I don't own, um, I've only bred out of 12 dogs to date out of those 100 that I have kept. The others I had sold to started dogs as time's gone on. But yeah, uh, we, we give it our all, you know. Um, uh, dogs definitely uh, are given the greatest opportunity to thrive. You know, we hunt uh, a minimum of 450 hours a season. We're out there 450 to 500 hours a season. We hunt 90 days all day long, sun up to sun down. The, you know, first year dogs, you know, get worked pretty much six days a week. And all the older dogs are getting, depending upon their age, you know, anywhere from, you know, four to six days a week. So um, we do a little bit of guiding, not much um mostly it's just uh all about, all about my dogs you know so uh once uh, september 1st comes it's uh we we dull out all the other noise and just uh focus on the north woods until whenever wisconsin's end date is for their season in january and um yeah so um come usually november so that's kind of the start of our breeding season so we like to have litters on the ground if mother nature cooperates between November and April, um, this past winter, she did not cooperate. So I have three litters on the ground right now. Which, oh, busy. Uh, is, yeah, busy, busy challenge. This is our training season, you know, so normally we'll, we'll have puppies uh, on the ground November to April, you know, end of May through Labor Day weekend. We have those puppies coming back to us for training. I might be doing a couple started dogs in addition to a couple of dogs I might be assessing for myself. We roll into the hunting season. That's straight through to the beginning of the year. And then we're kind of, that's our cycle, you know, and um, it's a, it's a nice cycle, you know? Um, so if we uh, subtract mosquitoes, seven feet of snow and uh, lots of poop scooping, we're, uh, <laughs> we're doing pretty good. So <laughs> Yeah, the good old UP and the snow and the bugs, man. I tell you what, that is, yep. uh, that is, I don't, I don't miss that at all, yeah. at all. Yeah. Well, it's been a rough year. <laughs> oh yeah, I hear you there. The you guys have so you run you run Llewellyns. There's, and correct me if I'm wrong, but there's basically two different strains of English Setter, correct? Um. Well, I guess it depends on, you know, how, uh, you know, what level of, of uh, history and snobbery we want to go down the rabbit hole. But I mean, ultimately, you know, uh, I would say that we have the American field bred English setters. Um, we have the Llewellyn setter. We have the show line type setters. And then we have Ryman style setters. And if you want to throw in like the European style setters, those would be the different types of, and those are all English setters. They could all be registered as English setters. Um, and they are all registered as English setters. The American Field Dog Stud Book is the only organization in the world that really recognizes a Llewellyn setter as a separate breed from the English setter. Um, that said, if you bred your Llewellyn to a registered English setter, those offspring are considered to be English setters. So, um, I'm not a Llewellyn snob. I mean, I, you know, my dogs are Llewellyns to date, I'm sure with our small gene pool and, uh, uh, you know, relationships that I've been working on making the last five plus years. Um, 
you know, that I'll have quote unquote English setters in the years ahead with a heavy concentration in the well and blood. Next week, actually, I'm scheduled uh, to go to Italy to go see some uh, setters in Northern Italy uh, work black grass in the Italian Alps. Cool. And um, so we're looking at some, some establishing some connections there. And my dogs are, uh, you have to look at breeders when you look at English setters, because there's no pointing breed on the planet that is more diverse in type because they're, you know, in terms of internationally speaking, there are many of them and geographically speaking, uh, different breeders have had different interests in their breeding goals because of the terrain, the, the coat type, you know, the confirmation, you know, there's, there's a, there's a lot of different things. I mean, at the end of the day, we can say that, um, you know, the, the most intelligent dog is going to be able to hunt anything anywhere but just in terms of uh body type temperament all these things everybody's got their own little spin on you know what they look for and in the last 20 years i've certainly had my my uh uh trying to design my niche setter for you know i'm strictly a grouse and woodcock hunter right so grouse hunter i didn't i didn't move here for woodcock <laughs> but uh, um the uh uh my pups uh you know I, i've i've bred raise several hundred puppies at this point and they're in all four corners of the country and they do well but you know like i said it's a it's an intelligent dog that um uh you know does well on all species and that's what we try to breed for that's what most breeders we hope try to breed for um but my dogs are kind of a hybrid i feel uh between the america the what what has become the classic american english setter of today um, and what is considered the classic European setter still of today, but, you know, um, uh, historically. So, uh, and I like that. I, I, it suits my needs very well. You know, my dogs are dogs that, um, uh, as I say, um, point intelligently according to the scent picture that they're given. So most of the time, my dogs happen to hit scent and they're within 10 yards of a bird. They set they they drop on the ground you know and and they're setting you know um, and if they're 20 yards or more off the bird they're standing tall high on both ends you know and mm -hmm. and that's that's all intel for me when i'm in the grouse woods um uh there's um a uh, couple different types of set uh, hunting dogs pointing dogs that i kind of categorize them as true dogs or tracking dogs and i've been on numerous podcasts people could find that i've uh you know, turn this subject inside and out. But, you know, in, in summary for the listeners, uh, I define a true dog as a dog that hunts with a high head, catching, you know, the air currents and, and uh, finding what we call this classic scent cone. Um, and when those dogs go on point, you know, eight out of 10 times, there's a bird there. And if there's a, not a bird there and it ran off that point, you know, if they go to relocate it, they usually find that bird within 30, 40 yards. So that's a true dog. That's what Americans historically have bred for. Um, that's what our, all of our testing systems are, are, are designed uh, for um, in this country. Uh, Europe favors uh, uh, tracking more. And um, so uh, a tracking style pointing dog, not just setters, but they come in all different breeds. But uh, we'll see um, uh, a dog that might go on point and it's on trail scent because this dog is running with its head between its uh, shoulders and its elbows. So it's catching air scent and ground scent at the same time. And uh, so as a result of that, you know, every great grouse dog is going to stop the moment it, it, it smells a bird. So it stops. You might get up there and then the dog, while you're getting there it's acknowledging that this is older scent and so it's waiting for you to get there and you kind of do this leapfrog thing with the with this setter stalking and pointing working up this trail depending upon how to use hound dog terms cold of a nose your dog has some dogs have weaker noses or more potent noses than others um that might uh the trail might be 50 yards long might be 30 yards long might be 200 yards long you know it just depends on uh where that bird's meandered to, when that bird acknowledges it's been had and it's going away from you in a linear sense, you know, as trying to evade us as predators. And so I, I personally uh, like that style dog. 
um, in my kind of cover. Um, you know, a great grouse dog is a great grouse dog, whether we're labeling them as a true dog or a tracker, but certainly, um, you know, my, I guess my brand of setter is, uh, is more that of the tracking style dog. And most uh, hardcore hunters that hunt a lot of wild upland birds other than maybe the bob white quail and woodcock most wild bird species will run um, if given the opportunity um, as they say the fly is to die so you know uh, whether we're talking grouse in the up ptarmigan in alaska chucker in idaho you know pheasants in iowa i mean the, all these birds run you know and having a dog that will um intelligently be able to connect you to the game uh, via trail scent um, can be very productive. And, you know, hunt strategy means a lot in terms of uh, effectively working your true dog and or your tracking dog. And I certainly have uh, my methods and ways of uh, that I hunt grouse that I that I feel is um, unique only based on having never met many other people that hunt the way that I do. And that comes from a decade in um, doing canine search and rescue and learning about scent theory and behavior, um, you know, and all the different scent pictures and the realm of capabilities and incapabilities of, of scent movement and the dog's ability to, to uh, be able to analyze that or have access to that. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, as I like to say, uh, uh, bird hunting is as complicated as you would like to make it. <laughs> you know, so. You're, man, you are spot on with that. It's interesting. You're talking about uh, the true dog versus the tracking style dog. And I've had both. Um, and, and both of them were short hairs, uh, yeah. German, German short hairs. Had a dog that was complete tracker, head up in the air. And exactly what, how you just described it, that's how she hunted. Had another one that head was lower and we would move and move and move and move and move. And I killed grouse obviously woodcock too but it killed grouse overall over both those dogs but the tracking dog for my style and how i wanted to hunt when i lived up there and i grew up in the upper peninsula as a lot of listeners know and that style of dog was by far the most effective for me in that part of the country and i yeah. think i think out here um you know we obviously hunt a lot of pheasants in wyoming um but we have tremendous chucker hunting very good hungarian partridge or gray partridge hunting and then of course sharp tail grouse in the eastern side of the state and sage grouse as well and a, that tracking style dog that move and move and move and keeps pushing that bird especially if you know your country and you can move that bird into an area where it's it has to flush you can pinch it and pin it down that's super effective but i never heard it described that way that you just did that was that's really cool yeah so it's uh you know i mean that that's just how i i explain it to uh uh my clients and 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 people all the time you know it's uh you know it's not for everybody you know um again i got half my dogs are true style dogs they hunt with the high head and they're great they're great grouse dogs it's just a completely different experience so my my true dogs um because they run with a high head, they generally hunt at a faster rate of speed. Because they hunt at a faster rate of speed, they generally range a little bit more. So, you know, uh, I pretty much consider, you know, um, uh, anything over a hundred yard dog, uh, a big running dog, you know, right, in the grouse right. woods, because a hundred yards can feel like a hundred miles. Oh, that's a mile you know? away in the grouse woods, yeah. man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Out yeah. here hunting so, chuckers, it's like, that's a good starting point. <laughs> yeah, right, right. You know, so... So I, I like uh, my, my true dogs are 50 to 100 yard dogs, usually 50 to 70 yards. And, and that's usually the distance they are when they're going on point. So the, the thing with um, uh, uh, the true dogs is, so, you know, we're all running GPSs today, Garmin's and whatnot. And I, and I run my dog silent on Garmin's. I, I like the quiet of the woods. I can hear flushes, you know, I just, you know, more connected I feel to the dog and the woods um so th th that's nice with that technology um but yeah dog goes on point 50 70 yards away you start walking that way you're following your your gps to the dog 
Um, that bird could be between you and the dog. That bird could be anywhere as you approach. Right. So um, there's just, uh, you know, I, I find that my, my true dogs, um, their success rate of finding and handling birds, I feel, is, is uh, pretty much the same as the trackers. But my shooting opportunities uh, are not as clean because that bird could be anywhere. Whereas right. half the time, now the tracking dogs, it's just an additional dimension. The tracking style dog, you know, if they hit a scent cone, they're going to lock up on point. There's no tracking involved to hit a scent cone. Right. You know, right. so, but, but half the birds they locate or more are done by trail scent. And once that trail gets established, you know, um, you pretty much have almost guaranteed that you're shooting is going to occur in front of that dog, you know? Um, so you went from a 360 degree possibility down to like 180. Yeah. Um, and those, and those away shots, you know, are, you know, I just, I put more birds in the bag over my trackers because of shooting up quality shooting opportunities, because in these woods, um, you know, and I don't subscribe, you know, there's, plenty of people that'll argue with this statement but i don't subscribe to dogs pin birds i believe that i believe that cover i think dogs can hold birds when birds are in cover where birds feel safe you know sure, sure. so you know if uh if if you got a a grouse you know in a a beak tasel run and it's kind of sparse it's not super dense and it and dog goes on point it's not going to hang out there. It's going to walk out and, and run to maybe a low, low bow, you know, spruce tree or, or, you know, some better thicker cover, you know, or a down log, you know, something that it feels it can conceal itself. So when we have these dogs that are quote unquote pinning birds, you know, in the grouse woods, um, that's only happening, you know, based on, the, the cover type that's that where the bird is, you know, we don't usually come across, you know, a pointing dog on point in very sparse cover and the grouse is staring at the dog and the dog is staring at the grouse and everybody can see everybody. The only time that ever happens is when the grouse just has bad timing and pops that on the logging road and there's the hunter and the dog, you know? Exactly. Um, it's not so, like those old paintings, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Those are, <laughs> those, are those, those, those are more um, uh, what we dream of rather than what we experience. But, yeah. you know, the um, so so the, the idea of the tracking style dog creating more shot opportunities, you know, I would say happens arbitrary percentage here, not based on any facts, but at least 50 percent um, more shot opportunities on my trackers per contact. You know, so my my tracker dog might have you know, uh, 10 points on a hunt and my true dog might have 10 points on a hunt. I guarantee you that I'm probably going to have six to eight shooting opportunities over my trackers versus my true dogs, which might be half that, you know? So yeah. now again, I'm also anybody that's hunting with me knows that like I go to where like no man has gone before in regards to the thickest, gnarliest stuff. I, 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 I harvest my fair share of birds, but it's, for me, it's all about bird content for my dogs you know i mean bird contacts make bird dogs and and grouse dogs and uh so you know i'll go and stuff where you know i'm i feel like i'm stuck in a spider web and i can't i can't move you know or i gotta you know butt first you know through that hazel cover you know and those dense young conifers you know uh, uh because going forward is just guaranteed to lose an eye kind of thing and they you know they say if you, if, if you cross your arms um and uh you know you don't and you fall backwards you don't hit the ground you're in good grouse cover you know and and yeah. uh you know that that's that's where we go and it doesn't always offer shot opportunities but you know how close can that dog get you to that bird to produce that shot opportunity those are the dogs in my eyes that are um that are the great ones and the just the experience you know in new york uh, we have pocket covers and the birds could run, but not that far because they're pocket covers. So they are real jumpy. Like you might be stepping into a pocket cover and they fly out the other side. Sure, um, sure. But, uh, you know, we have, there's New York can be a great grouse hunting state. If you have access to private land or you just have one or two dogs and, but you can, you can have to travel a lot sometimes, but you know, if I was hunting my true dog, they did a great job, but let's just say I hunted for an hour and we found two birds 
the if you're running the clock on the amount of time that there was action, you know, in, ter in terms of engagement between you and that bird and the dog is like two minutes with the true dogs <laughs> with two birds, you know, whereas we could have two birds in a cover hunting for an hour with the trackers and it might be 15 minutes of action because right. you're with that dog leapfrogging so there's the synergy a connectivity a watching the dog work rather than kind of running to a dog on point so to speak very often which what i find to be the case with my true dogs and it depends depends why you're out there i mean you know most people that hunt birds with dogs wouldn't hunt birds without dogs um but uh you know that they're it's a very different experience when i guide i ask the people what their experience are with dogs and the types of dogs that they've hunted and i kind of articulate the differences that we're kind of talking about here and you know um you know if if they're an experienced dog man most likely they've experienced both types of dogs and the true dogs right. and the trackers you know right um but people that i mean you know hunt pheasants and hunt chucker and hunt grouse in the lake states where they got room to run you know it's uh if you've had a good tracking dog i mean there's bad tracking dogs <laughs> you know the dogs that just don't stop and they put birds up you know but if you've had a really good tracking dog it's, it's kind of hard to to um uh rise above that connection with the dog and you know a bird in the bag uh you know after, after that type of hunting experience i mean i have I have so many people, I have so many grown men cry in the woods when they see a tracking dog, you know, you know, trail a bird for 50 to 150 yards, multiple sets and points, different, you know, uh, positions, all telling us stuff and sending them ahead. You know, I, I always say it's like, it's like kicking the overtime field goal in the Super Bowl, you know, when you connect with that, with that uh, situation, yeah. you know, yeah. um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's grouse hunting isn't for everybody tracking style dogs isn't for everybody but for the people that are truly truly passionate dog people and and avid upland hunters over pointing breeds um that hunt species that run a lot um it can be uh, it can be a lot of fun and it can be very effective it's interesting that you say that because i'm i'm thinking about you know my experiences there growing up as a kid and we had dude we shot grouse over beagles and labs and yeah. and setters and short hairs and britneys i mean you name it we yeah. had all kind of kinds of dogs I hunted them you know we hunted without dogs sometimes when you, you didn't have one you know and you just did whatever sure. you could but it was you know it was it was the most enjoyable how you described it um that the, the best short hair that i had she was a tracking dog and that was she was by we, I kill more birds over that dog than anything else. Yeah. Um, with a with my first lab being very a very close second. Just the way that dog could work birds, you know, you talk about pinning them or moving with them or whatever. I got a lot of shot opportunities over over both of those dogs. But I come out here and for guys that are you know talking about you know going to Arizona or Texas to hunt quail or coming out to Idaho or Wyoming to hunt chuckers or Montana prairie grouse in the Dakotas or, Mon or Eastern Montana. That's a different set of circumstances. It's totally different cover. Um, is there an advantage over a true dog in a, in wide open cover versus a tracking dog or is it, does it equate to yeah. the same? Sure. So that, that's an excellent question. It, um, uh, there's multiple layers to that answer. One is, um, uh i've never hunted roughed grouse a day in my life according to wind okay mm -hmm. yep. because in the woods the wind changes direction every 30 feet right okay? exactly so to me uh the and i've hunted over over well over 500 dogs in the in the grouse woods in my in my career you know to me the dogs that are finding birds the most handling birds the best their natural patterning becomes they kind of do a natural courting in front of you and then they do a big cast circle around behind you and come back out in front you know anybody that's you know hunted grouse a lot with great dogs you know 
you kind of feel like your dog hasn't checked in in a minute or five, how, whatever its normal thing is. And you're about to pick up your GPS. And where does the dog come from? Right up from behind you. Behind you. Know? you. Yep. You know, and comes up, you know, but it was just out in front of you before, you know. So, so those that, that, that zigzag cast and back and forth, quartering back and forth, two, three passes in front of you, then doing a cast, you know, whatever they're, whatever that dog's natural range is, you know, 30 yards, 50 yards, 70 yards, you know, they're, so they're, they're getting a high probability of detection by working that way because the wind's always changing direction. And that's one of the biggest things that I always preach about grouse hunting is that if you look at historically, every person that has a pointing breed, you know, if we call a productive point, a point that produces a flush, okay, how far away are the dogs from the birds when they have a productive point? And the answer is 90% of the time prior to November, you know, uh, when the ve- there's still vegetation up, you know, you're talking eight to 15 yards, 90% mm-hmm. of the time mm-hmm. when a dog goes on point and you're going to step in front of it and flush a bird, it's like eight to 15 yards away, you know? Yeah, sure. You could have a dog on point. It took you five minutes to get to the dog. You walk 15 yards in front of the dog and then 15 yards ahead of you, the bird goes up because that bird scooted out ahead of it while it took you so long to get there. Yeah. Um, but uh, by and large, eight to 15 yards. So why is that? Because pretty much, Todd, that's that's how far scent can travel, you know, in the grouse woods, you know. So so I take I've always taken that idea with my hunting strategy. And you look at these big running dogs, you know, you can work a big running dog can handle birds great. But they miss birds. You know, uh, the idea that dogs have super noses. I mean, in, in search and rescue, um, not to not to not to go down that rabbit hole. But you know, in search and rescue, we're we're looking for we're looking for people the same way with shepherds, the same way that our our bird dogs looking for birds. The difference is is that our scent source for an eighty pound shepherd looking for a one hundred to three hundred pound half naked man, our scent source is you know massive hundreds of pounds bigger yeah right yeah yeah so you really get to see when those scent pictures get amplified or magnified you know based on the size of the scent source therefore the amount of scent how how you can read that and how to interpret that in your bird hunting and on the same note you get to see how how a one pound bird in understory in the forest in September and October, the prime of our season when we're hunting them so much, you know, that scent really doesn't travel that far, you know, um, late season, once all the bracken is down, all the leaves are down, you know, all the yeah. soft mast is gone, you know, you sure you get a nice breeze, a weather front came through. Yeah. You'll get 30 yard points, no doubt. But most of the time your average grouse hunting day, when most people are grouse hunting is going to be eight to 15 yards. So if you have a dog that's very independent, a very forward hunter and quartering or however he's doing it, and you look at your GPS and you see basically acres of uncovered area, there's birds in there. And, and so, you know, how I choose to hunt and with the trackers, the trackers just don't miss birds. They're going to take longer to go through an area but they're going to be more thorough, you know? So when you have your true dogs, you need to, you need to make sure that you understand what probability detection is and, and what it is for that dog based on its hunting patterns, you know? And um, uh, so that's a big difference. So taking that information and now going like to the West or the Prairie, you know, open country, um, you know, people hunt wind all the time, right? You Mm -hmm. know, so uh, so that's a big thing. And the other thing that's big, that's a huge difference between, uh, my neck of the woods and yours is humidity, you know? So, yeah. uh, scent composition and quality is based on moisture content. So my dogs here, I know how cold or how potent some of my dog's noses are. They might pick up a six hour old grouse trail. How do I know that it's six hours old? Well, I use, I'm the pigeon guy. I'm a fourth generation pigeon racer in my family. Um, so I use pigeons, you know, during the training season. So, you know, when I, when I put out eight birds and, uh, I'm picking up the launchers as I'm working through dogs and the later dogs come around and they, you know, smack, smack, uh, a really hard point, you know, on, uh, a place where a launcher was six hours ago with a bird in it, you know, 
that's old scent, right? No, well, most people don't want their dogs to pay attention to that. Well, as a tracking dog uh, handler, it's good to know that the possibility is that that scent might be that cold, you know? Right, um, right. That's what you typically will never get in the West because humidity uh, and the fact that we're not training, you know, we're not, we're not like, you know, doing these knob to tests, you know, for our dogs, you know, on wild birds, you know, dragging, dragging dead birds, you know, and then waiting six hours and trying to train them to track something like that. So most of the time when dogs go onto a trail, um, in environments that are more open, so more exposed to sun, so sun burns up scent too, um, and therefore humidity as well. Um, these are what we refer to as hot tracks. They're fresh, you know? So I would be surprised, and I can't speak from experience, but I've had many, many of my dogs live all over the country and in those places and hunt those places. But um, I'd be surprised if you had, um, uh, you know, a chucker trail be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of yards long, you know, before you could spot those chucker. Now, again, we're talking about birds that might be covied 20, 30 together or something like that. Right, we're not talking right. about a, a, a singleton grouse track, right? So that also amplifies things. But out west, lower humidity, more direct exposure to the sun. Those are going to, you could have an, an amazing tracking dog, but just by nature of the environment, the tracking dog's going to track way less there than it will where I am because mm -hmm. of moisture and habitat um you know so it's just tracking uh is not naturally as um maybe conducive based on the elements and the the terrain um but uh you'll get your trackers out there but it's going to be hot tracks you know so those tracks are are going to be you know and i mean in the desert yeah they might be a couple hundred yards long but you're probably going to be hauling butt you know because oh, those birds those those blues those scalies were were running or something like that you yeah, know so yeah um but they're not you know the odds of of that track being six hours old i would say is, is probably pretty close to zero you know um yeah. whereas that would be the norm uh here you know if i'm hunting a, a really deep cover that i know like nobody's been there that day and i'm in and it's the afternoon you know um and those birds haven't been pressured or stressed all day and they're just kind of milling through the woods, you know, through their cover. Yeah. I mean, I, I, that absolutely. I'm sure that at times my dogs have started on six hour old trails, you know, That's and I amazing. can tell when they're, I can tell when they're, you know, they, they'll stop and they'll be standing real tall, you know, but they just, they won't have the, the rigidity in their body, but they're, they're there. They're like, just waiting for me. All right, I got it. Let's go. You know? And then as, as we, close in on the bird hone in on the bird through them uh tracking it stop and go stop and go you know their profile gets lower and lower and lower mm. indicating we're getting closer and closer and closer closer you know so the the predatorial canine brain wants to conceal itself you know as as it gets closer to its prey you know and and that's what they're doing and again i i like that i find it functional i hunt a lot on on swamp edges and stuff so i'm in alders all the time uh, you know, so lots of times, you know, so I'm leapfrogging with the dog, like I said, and, and when I step in front of that dog, you know, five, 10 feet and that dog doesn't move and we've been on a trail for a while, I know I'm going to get a flush. So I'm looking at little holes in the sky through these alders. And I always say, I probably shoot 20 to 30% of my birds on one or two knees, you know, just darting ahead of my dog, looking for that hole in the alders and, you know, looking up on a 45 as that bird's going to go up you know, just based on the information the dog gave me, you know, if the dog is still pointing tall, again, I'll, I'll be still be using my gun as a machete or turning my back <laughs> to advance forward, you know, through, through the thick stuff, you know, yeah, you know, yeah. I, I try, I try to, you know, refrain from the eye poking advancements uh, for potential shot opportunities rather than, you know, uh, still still a ways to go on the track so yeah well, that, that brings back some memories buddy holy smokes <laughs> <laughs> now we yeah. had we had uh i could always tell with uh that tracking short hair you talk about your dogs getting the center getting lower and lower and lower the hotter she got or the, the closer the bird they get and it was it was the tail on that tracking short hair that that little stubby tail 
it, if it was doing this, you know, slowly twitching back and forth, I knew we weren't that close, you know, and we were move mm -hmm. in, move in, move in, move in. <clears throat> and the more rigid that tail got, and the, and her eyes, her eyes would be if if we were close and a flush was going to happen, the tail would be rigid, and the eyes would be focused, like locked on, not going yeah. back and forth and, and wandering. It was amazing, fascinating to read the body language of, oh, yeah. of that dog in particular. Um, yeah. Pretty pretty crazy what how that all works. But that's that's interesting the the scent theory and scent dynamics that. The differences between back there where you are and out here where I am. I mean, obviously, if I'm putting a dog on the ground out here to hunt upland birds, it's it's going to have its nose into the wind. There's just, a, you know, I will drive four miles around, a, you know, rim rock section that I and hunt it with the wind in my face for that yep. very very reason. Yeah. Because otherwise, and your tracking my, dogs, your tracking dogs are going to capitalize on that when they're going right. to they're going to again an intelligent dog is going yeah. to use the resources that are given to them you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh you know it's it's very common i've had dogs that i've bred that live out that way and the owners had one or two hunting seasons with them and they thought that they were true dogs you know um because ah, of where they interesting. Hunt. and then they come then they come here <laughs> and they're here and after a couple of days the intelligent dog is saying whoa I, I actually smell birds a much higher percentage of the time in this cover if i stick my nose to the ground and you know after a few days of being here they're they're finding half their finds are via tracking you know yeah, um yeah and it, so so in you know environment weather you know um terrain you know, absolutely can impact how dogs work. I mean, again, and you can have dogs like our field trial bred dogs or field trial bred setters, you know, um, you know, America has been very successful in breeding the type of dog that they have wanted in that respect. And that is a dog that's high on both ends, is hard running, hard stopping, you know, all the time, you know, again, different strokes for different folks. Um, I, for me, that that's just not my kind of dog. Um, but uh, uh, those dogs often will look the same on point, whether they're five yards off the bird or fifty yards off the bird. Yeah, you know yeah. that that for me being exclusively a forest hunter at minimum, and our shooting lanes and opportunities are very limited to begin with. Um, that doesn't do me any good in terms of intel. Like I, I'm so used to you know, having the dog convey to me mm -hmm. where this bird is and how close it is or how far away it is that, um, that language as, as you, as you, uh, label it, um, correctly, you know, uh, is, uh, is vital, you know, if we're, if we're talking about, uh, um, you know, getting, getting birds in the bag on a, on a, on a high level. And again, I hunt, I hunt, lots of you can find birds in lots of places you know that are more open uh new york hunting you know you know half the birds that fly in new york die because it's just it's rolling farmland you know just yeah. brushy and thick and you know but you find lots of hawthorn and lots of dogwood tangles and stuff that you know are not more than five feet high and you know the birds got to fly at some point you know once once you're once you've got it down there and uh those birds uh, survival on the wing are, are far less than, than our, cl our classic Northwoods um, yeah, here yeah. Um, because of the, because of the density. Yeah. The Northwoods is a tough place to hunt birds. You know, it's a tough place to hunt anything in particular, but <laughs> it's uh, yeah. You throw, I remember um, had a buddy in college that came from out here, out West in the mountain States and two things that he couldn't do he couldn't walk a straight line in the woods um without getting lost and i mean like within a quarter mile he'd be turned around and yeah. he could not hit grouse and woodcock because he couldn't yeah. get it through his head that he was looking for wide open you know shots and but there's brush i'm <laughs> like yeah that's good you're gonna have that buddy 
you yeah. know, so yeah. he, he walked a lot of logging roads, you know, uh, well, we would dive in, he'd stay out where we knew he was going to not get lost. Yeah. Oh man. But yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's funny to talk about, you know, and, and compare the different, the different types of hunting, upland hunting, the different uh, styles of it. You know, I've told my wife, I'm, I'm working on a, on a young 15 month old British Labrador right now and he's oh, well he's awesome and and i hunt a lot of waterfowl and he's he's i did not make the mistake i've made with my other labs and start him on like upland birds so uh -huh. he's actually not <laughs> he actually stands a chance of being rock solid with very minimal effort in the blind yeah. but you know all my other ones started out hunting grouse and pheasants and then you, i expect him to sit still you know in a, in a duck blind it's like uh yeah good luck with that but uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> any, anyway, I told her, I said, you got my old, my old dog, Mackinac, who is, uh, he's 10 and he's, he, he's about ready to be retired, you know? And I told her, I said, when we get another one, it's going to be a setter. And yeah. she's like, okay, that's fine. I got three little kids that like to go roam around in the hills and, and love to eat chucker, you know? So it's yeah. kind of like, yeah. it's like, sure. Yeah, and hunting chuckers with a lab is no fun, unless you <laughs> unless you really like exercise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the, the terrain is hard enough, right? Oh so, man, but yeah. oh, it's it's crazy, crazy. But you have, I'm going to completely switch. This has been an awesome conversation, but you bring up a point on your website. You say an important message from Paint River Llewellyns, and you talk about in there having a working dog that has a task that has a job and if mm -hmm. you're not if you can't provide that for your dog to think about um adopting a dog from a shelter yeah 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 go, go into that because that's something that when i read that it resonated with me on a very deep level as i've always said if my dogs don't have a job that they're bred for I, it it makes it hard for me to even want to have that dog, you know? Sure. Sure. Yeah. I mean, so, uh, you know, in, including all dogs under the sun that I've trained for all different facets of life, you know, I've, I've trained over 4,400 dogs and 3,500 people, um, in the last 25 years. And, uh, the, the things that I've, repeatedly witnessed is that one people have the wrong dog for them um you know we're picking dogs you know based on what they look like you know more than more than anything else um uh and two we got you know we have the classic communication barrier right you know how how dog savvy is the novice dog handler right you know with their new dog you know people are always anthropomorphizing you know, uh, uh, you know, our feelings onto what the dog thinks. And, and that can get tricky because dogs do have the same emotional spectrum as humans, but they're not human. <laughs> so, you know, it's, uh, uh, they're much more of a rigid hierarchical creature than we are. And, uh, they can use that to their advantage sometimes, but, um, you know, so, and these, these working dogs can be, can be phenomenal family dogs, uh, but, you know, they, by design, I mean, my dogs are, you know, my dogs are some, some of the closest working setters you're going to find collectively speaking, but I still require people to have a fenced in yard, you know, that are going to buy my dog, you know, because I mean, if you got your butt up in the air and you're gardening, you know, you, you live in a beautiful place, you got lots of land, you know, the dogs gets comfortable there. If, if my dogs are outside and they're not on a fenced in yard, they're hunting, you know, and they will repeatedly give you the opportunity to accompany them on that hunt, <laughs> you know? Um, but, uh, uh, you know, if not, you know, they're gonna, in, in terms of being home and again, their comfort there, they're gonna keep expanding their area, you know? Um, and that's just, that's just how accidents happen and stuff. And now if we're out hunting, I can be in the middle of the woods. If I stop, my dog, goes their natural range 50 yards whatever i sit down my dog effort search that it's not going to keep on leaving me and going further and expanding uh territory it's going to come and jump on me punch me in the chest say hey i got this all covered we're going to keep moving but when you're home and the dog knows you're not in hunting mode but it wants to keep doing it 
it's a it's a different it's a different uh, scenario and i think uh i just think that people uh a lot of companion dog people that might you know fancy certain breeds and we have breeds today the labrador included you know that you know you can have many many generations removed from the working dog you know mm-hmm. um and uh you know i obviously i'm a purebred kind of guy I, I have purebred dogs but if we're talking companion dogs you know and I, uh while 99 percent of my puppies have gotten and always will get sold to um families that hunt uh I get loads of inquiries from people that they're active families, you know, and, um, you know, they're going to give the dog a a great home, but the odds are they don't need, they want a Llewellyn setter, but they don't need a Llewellyn setter to be happy with a companion dog. You know, they could, they could go find, you know, uh, a a nice pure better mixed breed dog and, you know, a shelter, you know, we're, we're, we're euthanizing thousands of dogs every day because we just don't have homes for them. And, yep. you know, uh, uh, God bless everybody that, that goes and adopts dogs, you know, um, uh, you know, I, I certainly don't want to see or hear about very nice dogs having to be euthanized just because they don't have a home. But, uh, you know, I think finding the right dog for you and, and, and realizing it's getting those people, the non-working dog people to realize the, the instinctual, the instinctual value of the working dog and the extent, uh, to what extent that can make that canine content by those instincts being fulfilled. And I feel that, um, hunting dogs are different than like shepherds you know shepherds are like a multi-purpose dog yeah you know so they got like the high prey drive the high possession drive you know a ball on a string and a tug toy and you can teach that dog everything you know um our bird dogs sure one could definitely argue that they could be taught anything you know but for what we've been breeding them for for hundreds of years (laughs) you know um uh it's 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 kind of um, counterintuitive to, you know, get one of these bird dogs or these versatile dogs that do feather and fur, you know, and then constantly discourage them from that engagement. Like to me, I just feel that's wrong. You know, it's just wrong. You know, um, you I, know, we're not talking, we're not talking pork, we're not talking porcupines, but if we're talking, you know, upland birds and snowshoe hares, you know, I mean, it's a, uh, it's a, you know, it's just not uh you know shame on shame on us humans i feel that that do that so there's plenty of dogs out there that need homes that these people could be happy with um that are not my dogs and my dogs they love to snuggle they'll sleep underneath your covers if you want they're great with kids i mean they're a nice size they're they 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 i always say they're running for mayor you know um if you got a barbecue going on they're gonna be handing they're gonna be handing out buttons you know uh, it could be the dead of winter. They got a great off switch. If it could be the dead of winter, you know, they haven't had exercise in a month. You want to sit down in the middle of the afternoon and watch the Titanic for three hours. They'll curl up in a ball next to you and watch the Titanic. So they're, they're great companion dogs, but they are working dogs. You know, they, yeah. they were, they were dogs designed, you know, by design to have purpose. And, um, and uh, when you fully tap into that instinctual purpose, it, it's a, uh, it is a more fulfilling life for the dog. Even if the dog doesn't know, doesn't know it because they've never had that experience. Yeah. You know, um, I, I have sold dogs to people that uh, Bob Whaley, the famous uh, L. Hugh Pointer breeder, um, you know, uh, I don't know if he invent, coined the, the phrase um, dry hunting, you know, but, you know, people that they don't carry a gun, they go out, they like to watch their dogs work and the dogs are hunting and the people are hunting with their dogs are just not harvesting any birds, you know, yeah, and yeah, yeah. nowadays with technology, we carry around cameras, you know, I, it's not, I have no problem with that. If I have an avid dry hunter that wants to carry around their Canon camera instead of their Canon shotgun, you know, um, I don't care. That's fine. You know, dog still fulfilling, you know, three quarters of its genetic destiny, so to speak, you know? Um, and uh, so, you know, it's, but it is important to have the right dog for, for yourself. And, um, I think, uh, over the years as a breeder, 
you, you kind of learn, you know, I'm the TMI guy, you know, so if you've been on my website, you see there's a, a wealth of information there. And um, it's a great, you know. it is a great website. For you guys that are listening, you got all kinds of stuff on there. I've checked it out and you've got your own podcast called Setter Talk. Correct. Yeah, not not as active as I would like, but I have that, and certainly all the in this episode, I'll I'll post on there once you get this up and yep. running, and you know, so there's there's a lot of information that to try to help. You know, I vet everybody the best I can. I talk to them for an hour or two on the phone, and mm-hmm. you know, um, uh, I have them fill out an application that gives that gives me a lot of information. But at the end of the day, you know, I mean, it takes you years of living with somebody to get to know them really well. You yeah, know, a one yeah. a one page application and a two hour phone call doesn't make you uh, the expert on that individual. So, so I try to just give them as much information as possible to try to help them make an informed decision if they're in the right place or not for themselves. And uh, and that makes it so you know my pups go to forever homes and you know my my, my dogs are not in shelters um, you know and they never will be you know and that's. I think that's the responsibility of the breeder to try to, you know, make sure that doesn't happen. I think that's, I think that's a great philosophy, man. I, I really do. Like I said, when I, when I read that on your, on your webpage, and then the, I wanted you to explain it and talk about it a little bit, because I feel the exact same way. Um, and I don't care if it's a shepherd, like I, I've had shepherds too. And it's when they were happiest, when they had a job, you yeah. know, when, especially shepherds, holy smokes, that dog would. Oh yeah. That in, that one in particular, if he had the ability to protect, patrol, and provide, he was happy. You know, yeah. if he if he yeah, didn't, yeah. oh, he, you know, he tear stuff up. He was a pain in the butt when he didn't. But when you gave him those opportunities, he was awesome, just awesome. Yeah, and I man, I could tell you, I could tell you stories about shepherds. You know, I I, I rattle off these these numbers. You know, forty four hundred dogs. 2000 of them have been shepherds you know so <laughs> my my aunt my aunt that bred the shore hairs also bred german shepherds from uh-huh. germany and uh and they've always been a popular breed in america so uh and i was in search and rescue you know for 10 years and i bred shepherds as well and just very a very very different breed you know like the set like the english setter it's a breed that has polar opposite ends of the spectrum available you know, right. in terms of type, you know, right. Right. but uh, yeah, I mean, what got me crazy, you know, you're familiar with shepherds and you're familiar with, you know, Schutzen dogs, you know, obedience, protection, tracking sport. And there's three levels of, so, you know, you get these, these people that, you know, um, could afford to buy these dogs for 15 to $25,000, all trained in German, you know, but they were kennel dogs, you know, they were, yeah. you know, yeah. they, you know, so they, they, they're shits and three dog multiple times. Mm. They'll save any, any person they're bonded to They're they're, they, they're trained within an inch of their life kind of thing, but they were kennel dogs and they were shepherds, you know, so they were out on the training field, put away, you know, and now they come home and they got to live with three cats, five children, all the, all their friends that come over, you know, and so they, they basically got this $20,000 dog that needs to be trained all over again for their Mm -hmm. particular life, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, uh, because this amazing animal is a monumental liability for them, (laughs) you know, and it's, it's, uh, you know, the, the, the realm of shepherds is uh, again, just as vast as the realm of setters when it comes to type and, and stuff. And that's a, that's a, with that litter, when I was breeding the shepherds, which was in the middle of my Llewellyn, you know, time, uh, you know, I would, I would, I would be looking at the puppies and I would never let anybody choose uh, a shepherd puppy. I would always put them because depending upon what the home was, whether it was law enforcement, mm-hmm. search and rescue, right, just an active right. family. Whereas the Llewellyns is different. Everybody's coming to me for the same reason, you know, and, uh, uh, and we're trying to breed that, you know, uniform uniformity there um, that uh, for the same singular purpose, and, you know, not to say I wasn't trying to breed for the same singular purpose in shepherds, but you just get there's very different personalities in the same litter when it comes to shepherds. And, uh, uh, you know, it would very much influence where those puppies would go, where with the Llewellyns, other than me, like maybe taking, you know, my personal pick of the litter and wanting to go to that one home of the seven people that hunt 70 days in a season kind of thing. You know, um, there everybody's coming to you for the same reason. Uh, which is good. It makes your breeding program, um, uh, you know, uh, goals 
more clear and it and it facilitates a, a better feedback in the offspring that you're producing versus like the shepherds that the lady that you know she's just a marathon runner and the dog runs with her and the other guys in law enforcement the other person's in search and rescue there's a lot of a lot of differences there you know so yeah no that you're spot on spot on 100 percent and that was like i said i wanted you to talk about that i wanted you to bring that up because it was something that i i read that and i was like yep i definitely agree on that point so we gotta talk yeah, yeah. about that one but oh yeah. cool man well we're hitting it right at an hour right now and it's been a great conversation i appreciate it um yeah i know like i had mentioned i i found you um actually looking for a dog for my dad and i don't know when he's going to be ready or if he's even going to be ready for another one but if he is i'm going to have him get a hold of you because i i think that would be a really good fit and i am definitely going to be getting a hold of you when my old when my old lab make space unfortunately so <laughs> yeah, yeah um but yeah man i i really enjoyed our conversation and i gotta ask one last question that i try to close out my podcast with and i think yeah. i know what the answer is going to be but i gotta ask it anyway you can only hunt one bird one way for the rest of your life what's it going to be uh it would be the only bird that i've ever hunted my whole life and that's <laughs> grass you know i I have dog, I have birds on bucket list. I mean, I, I would love to get to Alaska someday and hunt ptarmigan. I, I, I have a lot of Norwegian blood in me. So I grew up listening to these stories of Norwegian ptarmigan, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, so there's, there's a part of me that would like to, to hunt them someday. Um, but, uh, you know, being from upstate New York and our native bird was uh, the rough grouse, you know, and, um, you know, no, that just, uh, that bird, grabbed a hold of me real good and uh i just uh my my clients are like come with us in january to to nebraska oklahoma kansas come hunt quail and i just you know uh some of my friends just joke like that i like i i, I just choose to suffer through the winter with the rough grouse you know like <laughs> i just uh it's my bird and i really have zero desire to hunt any other species i live vicariously through my uh my puppy clients and friends that hunt around and I think it's cool. And, and, uh, you know, I just, uh, I'm where I'm supposed to be. And, uh, maybe someday, um, you know, I moved, I moved to where I can hunt out my back door and, uh, and, you know, drive and drive a couple hours in any direction. And yeah, the rough grouse is, is, uh, uh, has been my destination for the last 32 years of, of my hunting life. And, will be for the next 32 years yeah. <laughs> so. I, I i knew that was going to be your answer there sure. are when, it, when people talk about the king of game birds that's the one that caught that that's it for me too rough grouse is, yeah. and our unfortunately our rough grouse out here are quite naive compared to the ones yes. back where in your neck of the ones where oh, i grew yeah, up yeah. too well i went I, I i've actually petted some out on, on, on archery <laughs> elk hunts and yeah you no i hear that can reach down and touch them and it's like no nah, man yeah <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, they get here, they can, you know, they can get dumb on the road here, you know, they, they don't feel threatened, you know, by mm -hmm. ATVs and stuff like that. But yeah, pretty much Minnesota to the East Coast is a totally different species than, than what you guys got out there. And, you know, you haven't been from here, you, you know that I mean, certainly, you know, early season, the young ones, you know, can yeah. be dumb, you know, on any species, but uh, it's funny when I sell people the chucker country like in Utah, Washington, Oregon, you know, every one of them has to make a point to say like, you know, I think I would argue with you on the king of all game birds because they're thinking of their grouse, you know? Mm -hmm. And I was like, you come hunt birds in New York, North Carolina, you know, or the UP, you know, and you'll have a different appreciation for, you know, chasing those, these birds here with dogs um you know and it, and it presents a challenge sure if they were an open cover you know i'm sure yeah it's lot, different it's different easier. yeah but I, they, I, but if they they use their cover i mean they, it's, yeah. it is their habitat it is yep. their kingdom and and they will put that spruce tree between you and them every time you know? yes sir they absolutely will do it yeah oh man well that's super cool man like i said thank you kyle i appreciate your time and it was good 
catch, uh, getting to talk to you about some things. I definitely learned a lot in this podcast, as I hope the listeners did as well. And maybe we touch base again after the fall and see how your hunting was. Um, oh, yeah. What, what are your bird numbers looking like up there? Are you, are, where are you in the cycle? Um, well, uh, I mean, I would say, you know, longtime locals would say that uh, years on the nines are are the peak years and having hunted here for 10 years now i would i would agree with that yeah um so i mean i you know a better year you know hunting in the lake states any year is still a better year than anywhere else kind of thing you know um uh we had good we had you know the thing with like thunderstorms and stuff it can be so isolated but um in my area we had we had uh pretty severe it was a bad spring for a uh, spring hatch i i think a lot of our i have only seen three broods and there were only two to three in a brood and they were still like cotton balls and that was just last week so oh, wow. i think i i would anticipate that um most of the hens lost their first clutch of eggs and so usually if they don't hatch they'll lay a second clutch so right right i think we'll uh i think i'm gonna be i'm hoping that i'm gonna be seeing a lot of little cotton ball grouse uh sometime uh you know this month later this month um for a second second clutch and it's been dry lately so if they if they're hatching you know they kind of need to get fully feathered a bit before you get all the rain and everything um and we had it was the middle of june and we we would have an inch of rain lots of wind and then like in the morning it was like 30 degrees in the middle of june you know so that kills them so yeah so we'll see but we had great winter retention you know it was a great it was a great grouse winter you know um classic up winter but we had we had for over two months we had four plus feet of snow on the level on the ground here and it was bone cold here for a couple months so you'd see the birds budding in the trees and they just yep. dive right into that snow. And yeah, uh, that's, so. that's like you said, that's a classic grouse winter. That's they, yeah. they, they thrive in that. Absolutely. Yeah, no, thrive win, in win, it. Winter, winter retention for adults was very good. So hopefully, hopefully we get a second clutch and, you know, it varies so much regionally though. I mean, you could drive 80 miles a different direction from here yeah. and yeah. They, they might have, they might have chicks right now, the size of quail, you know? It's, it's, yeah, exactly. Uh, Yep. hard hard to say i always see a uh, variable age broods in my general hunting zone so yep. yep yeah cool well awesome man like i said thank you very much 